Um, by request, we're, we're going to talk about the Lawrence Tavern and um, by extension of, about that little enclave of, of buildings down um, just by the Blackberry River, which uh, was a nucleus of settlement when Canaan was brand new. Um, the oldest building of that cluster, right by the firehouse, is the Lawrence Tavern, but it is not by far the newest house that, uh, or the oldest house that, that Isaac Lawrence built. Um, when I was working at the Adams Farm this year, uh, scanning all of those papers, I came across this really cool map which I am dating between 1790 and 1810 based on the fact that that's the, uh, what's in the cluster of, of papers that I was working through at that time. Uh, based on the handwriting, I think it might be by William Adam, who was a grandson of Squire Forbes and married a granddaughter of um, Isaac Lawrence. And it's by no means to scale, but it's interesting because it shows the properties that were extant at that time. This is, I think, I'm sorry, <laughs> we're not going to do that. That, that area right over there is uh, where Isaac Lawrence had his original farm. Um, Rattlesnake Hill, this <coughs> odd-shaped amoeba, is uh, listed as being his property. That's Rattlesnake Hill. And then this <clears throat> elongated parcel there is also bears his name, although I can't really read what, what they're saying it is. In fact, uh, Isaac Lawrence was a major wheeler dealer when it came to property, and by the middle of the 19th century, I have a map that shows that the Adams slash Lawrence family owned virtually the entire center of town to the Sheffield border, so they, they acquired a great deal of property. But when he first arrived in town, and I think it's interesting, he, he came to Canaan on June 2nd, he finally arrived uh, in 1738. The town was, was sold in January 37 slash 38. I always find that old calendar to be enormously confusing. And he packed up his family the next spring. He lived, he was born in Groton in 1704. Um, and the family moved to Plainfield, which is now Killing, Killingly, um, sometime during his early life because of the uh, problems with Indians. And so he, he moved from Plainfield field to Canaan in 1738, having purchased one share, which was approximately 50 acres of land, in the public auction in New London that January. Um, I can't remember, to be honest, and I, I should have researched this, but I'm not sure whether they, they bid on a specific piece of land when they bought a share or whether it was assigned. Somewhere in the back of my memory, I think they were assigned to them, and then they, they all swapped and moved around once they got here if they didn't like what they had. He didn't, he didn't appear to question what he had, so maybe he, he bought it outright or had seen it before. Um, he stayed put. They, it took them nine days, and some say 14, to traverse the distance between Plainfield and Canaan. <clears throat> they, uh, from, there was some settlement, minimal settlement, up to New Hartford, but after that it was just pretty much unbroken wilderness. And uh, according to the family history, he had to cut his way through the forest. They supposedly had an ox cart filled with their possessions. He was 34. Um, I don't know how old his wife was, but they had four children. And um, she supposedly rode a horse. And the woods, if you believe the accounts, were so thick 
coming through what they called the Greenwoods, that her knees would brush the trees on both sides as they passed through the trees. So obviously to get an ox cart through all of that was not easy, and he was fortunately a big strong man and uh, in the prime, <coughs> and uh, he had to cut down the trees, uh, get them out of the way, move his ox cart forward, build some kind of bridge to get his, uh, his cart across it. Um, they came in about seven or eight days to Norfolk, and they camped in a meadow uh, up on the high rise in Norfolk, and uh, in the meadow they found a dead bloom. So when you sit here of Bloom Meadow in Norfolk, that's Isaac's name for that piece of property. Uh, not only were they coming at just about the same time that we're going through in the season right now, they apparently had very much the same kind of weather because it snowed <coughs> sometime close to June. <laughs> I, th I thought it might snow yesterday. Um, when they got up in the morning, they found that there was a bear track next to their cart. So they apparently had the same problems then with bear predation. They probably smelled the food they had and or maybe the animals and came right into camp. So Isaac, who was a very, very religious man, calmed his children by saying that God had, had saved them. He, as the book says, he improved the hour for the children by relating it to their salvation. Um, they came down, as nearly as I can figure, they came down through Canaan Valley and out and, and to their property, um, which is located along the Blackberry uh, at the foot of Ch Church Terrace. Um, the book says that they camped the first night 80 rods southwest of the current tavern. And they camped under a, a large oak tree. The next day, Isaac, being who he was, gets up, goes to work. He's got, he's got a bunch of things to do. It's June. He's got to get the very first thing they had to do was prepare for the winter. So they really needed to get a crop in the ground, which meant he had to clear the land. He had to till it. He had to get something in the ground to um, preserve them. So he would have undoubtedly gotten root vegetables in. He would have maybe planted some corn, rather like the crops the Indians have been planting in the area uh, for centuries. Um, with the trees that he cut down, he would have formed fences. He would have cut them up um, to create the enclosures that they needed. At the same time, he had to find some shelter for his family. And I can just see Mrs. Lawrence, you know, here she is, four little kids. Everything she's got is in an ox cart that can't be very large. And, um, and she's got to make, a, make her way out here. So his idea of a quick solution to housing was to dig a hole in the hill mm -hmm. and uh, put up some boards that he had brought, probably brought with him since there was no sawmill. Uh, across the front, and the family lived in that for the first winter, which sounds utterly gruesome, except that it probably was warmer than if he put up a plank house, because the plank houses that, that people of English descent built in the colonial period were pretty wretched, and the wind would blow through, and they were not insulated, so he would have he would have had a very chilly winter if he had put up a little shack for them to live in. Next spring, um, probably she had had enough of dirt dripping on her head, though, and he built his first house. And I am not 100% sure where that was. Um, the, the plain area down towards the river, um, I think, would be, have been lo the location 80 rods southwest of his home. Is roughly where it was. And uh, they lived there for a number of years, and then he built a better house, this time somewhere close to where the um, old center school was on Granite Avenue. I'm not sure whether it was on top of the hill or maybe where Fuller's office is, somewhere in that area. Both houses long since gone in 1851. 
according to the family history. That second and third, or first and second house, I guess you should term them, were um, where his, the largest portion of his large family grew up. Um, they lived in, in that for a, a quite a number of years, till 1751. He had nine children, five of them were gone by the time he moved into, into the uh, tavern. <clears throat> gone as in dead or gone as in... A lot of them were dead. He lost five children in one year, I think one to marriage and four to death, babies. But he still had a, a number of, of children that moved into the uh, tavern. So in 1750-ish, probably, he decided he was going to build himself a nice home. It's listed in histories as being the first nice building in Canaan. And it's one of the nicest still. Um, I, this, this house, the yellow house, uh, which was located where McDonald's is today, I had mistakenly thought was his uh, second home. It is not, but it was William Adams' house, and so it was probably built. And it's not on the first map, so I'm, I'm thinking it was built in the early part of the 19th century, and was William Adams' home at that time. So cross out that information I've given you before because I was wrong. Um, so this is the first image we have of the Lawrence Tavern. This was used in the, um, in the little book that the genealogy that the family put out after their 1851 reunion. Uh, I think they probably had it commissioned at the time. The clothing of the women out here is consistent with the mid-19th century, so I'm sure it was done then. It actually looks like a barber uh, painting, but it's not credited to him, so I, I kind of doubt that he is maybe one of his disciples. Um, you can see that the building has, has maintained its uh, lines remarkably. Uh, some of that is is thanks to Jim Lyle. This is the building in um, 1951 on its second 100th anniversary. And I'm not going to get too close to that thing, but you can see that down on, on the southern end, there is a porch <coughs> that was of Victorian origin. And Jim stripped away all the geegaws that had been added. He did a marvelous restoration of the building, stripping away paint, cleaning the wonderful paneling that's in it down to its natural layer, preserving a lot of the architectural detail of the house. Um, Isaac Lawrence became very prosperous. Um, the southern half of the house, as he designed it, was a tavern. And he, the, it remained active as a tavern, not continuously, but over a great many of uh, the years for almost a century. And um, if, if what I've been told can be believed, it was the place where more well-to-do travelers stopped when the, train, uh, when the stagecoach came through. The drivers, their horses and carriages and less well-off passengers would go down to Stevens Tavern, which was up over the hill and down where the, the rail yards are today. And that was kind of a rowdy place. So it was not anywhere near as genteel as, as uh, Isaac Lawrence's house. The northern half was family dwelling. Um, it appears that, I just took a picture of it this morning to show what it looks like today. You can see it's being wonderfully preserved by the family. I think it's the ninth generation that's currently taking care of it. And I think that is just incredible that they have found, there was only one brief period of time when it went out of the family. Um, Squire Forbes purchased it in 1824 and owned it until 1827, at which point his uh, grandson, William Adam, um, 
who purchased it from him, William had married Isaac's granddaughter, who was born in the house. So it, it quickly looped right back. It, its diversion from the family was not very far or very long. Um, so the, uh, the use of the house uh, has been pretty, pretty consistently in the family. And the neighborhood has, has continued to attract members of the family. This, this house was built by Fitch Ferris. It's across the street from the tavern. And Ferris had a store next to it. Um, he was a, a successful businessman. That store was moved um, down behind into um, Whiting Court behind the Canfield building at a later date, so it's not there. And then this house later was um, occupied by a bunch of people, but in the, uh, most recently by the Eddy family, Lawrence Eddy, who was a direct descendant from Isaac. So again, we're, we're staying within the family. And then this house um, was occupied by, uh, in his later, his later years, by Sam Eddy, who was, again, a direct descendant of Isaac and uh, Lawrence and Allerton Eddy's father. He was a town father of considerable note. So uh, this, is, this little enclave had some powerful people in it for a lot of years. Isaac uh, clearly understood his place in, in history and uh, when he devised his house, he created this stone. And it says, Isaac Lawrence came here June 2nd, 1738, just in case we had any reason to doubt that. And uh, this house built in 1751. And then underneath it, he has his name and the date of his death in 1793, his wife in much smaller letters, who died of, in 1761, age 60, after producing nine kids, I think it was. He later married again, but had no, no children. And then he lists his sons on this side and his daughters on this side. And, uh, Hawthorne used to hang around in this neighborhood when, when he was at the height of his popularity. And he wrote that it was rather odd to have uh, the names of the family written on a, on a stone where everyone was going to step on it. But it's maintained itself for all these years, so it's rather a lovely family record, indelibly <coughs> inscribed. Now, where is this stone? It's the front door. Okay, the front. Okay. Yep, right in front of okay. the front door. Um, let me see. These, I apologize for these pictures. I don't have access to my negatives when I took pictures for the newspaper. And the last time I took pictures of this house was 20 years ago. So um, I had to resort to some that I had copies of the stories and just take pictures of the pictures. So they're not prime. This is the, uh, the fireplace that Lydia Hewitt Lawrence would have cooked her family dinners on. Uh, the Lyles uncovered it behind a more modern fireplace when they were doing their renovations. And they were such wonderful antiquarians and, and enjoyed their family lore so much that they used to uh, cook on it regularly. They, they took a course in, at Cooperstown in how to cook an op on an op open hearth and they would enjoy <clears throat> preparing their meals on it. Um, this is looking into the room, <coughs> excuse me, um, from the, what actually uh, was, was the uh, tavern area. And you can see the fireplace and the chairs belong to, I think it was Jonas Lawrence, his son. So some of, and many of the furnishings around the fireplace reflect the family history. Um, I'm gonna go here for a second. Um, when they had when they had their 18 or 1951 open house 
it was marvelously organized <clears throat> and they handed these things out to people so they knew what they were looking at and uh, so many of the pieces in there belonged to family members 1951 here we are Okay. It says here, the dining room to the right of the parlor was the original kitchen. The fireplace of field stone is five feet wide and four <coughs> and one half feet high, fully equipped with old wrought iron utensils as well as a brick oven for baking, which the Lyles had rebuilt. Um, over the mantel uh, are the uh, old pewter mugs of Isaac Lawrence and Heman Allen, who was a nephew of Ethan Allen. <coughs> and an old loggerhead, which on occasion during recent years has fulfilled its original mission. The comb-back chairs in this room belong to Josiah Lawrence. Okay, so it was a grandson, not a son. Um, the two portraits on the walls, which I don't think we can see here, were of Charlotte and, and William Adam. And uh, William actually owned the house from 1828 to uh, 1884. So, Again, a long, long history of family ownership. Um, now, if you come in back through this door, you're on the side that was open to the public during uh, the early days of tavern use. And uh, <coughs> the Lyles had very interesting time recovering this area. Uh, the bar had been taken out, but when he, he dismantled it, um, Mr. Lyles was able to determine that it was an original part of the house. So the house was built with the intention of being a public house. Um, when he was working on the fireplace, they removed the mantle uh, and fire surround temporarily. And behind it, this was also the post office for the town at that time, and they had linen strips tacked up over the mantle, and they would tuck the mail into it until the people could come and, and claim it. And uh, so when they dismantled that section for, to uh, restore it, they found some original pieces of mail down behind the mantle, and uh, they have those framed on the wall. Uh, one of them, was 77 years old when he uncovered it in the 50s. So we talk about the post office today. That's some kind of delivery. Um, they upstairs, oh, I should go to the other side of the hall first. This um, is what they call the study. I love this room. This picture is circa 1975, so I have no idea what it looks like at the moment. I haven't seen the house for a number of years. <clears throat> but that's Heman Allen in the large portrait. Um, here we have the Honorable Samuel Letty. Uh, let me see if I can find a list of things that's in this room because it's a, a mini museum. Okay, the study, well named since there are bookcases on three walls spilling out of uh, out books which reflect the tastes, interests, and nature of the family which for over 200 years and through seven generations have used this room. We're not surprised to find here Pilgrim's Progress, many copies of the Holy Bible. They were ardent, ardent um, Protestants. Um, as well as history, biography, reference books of all kinds. There are complete sets of Macaulay, Carlyle, Thackeray, Jane Austen, De Quincey, and George Eliot, and Dante's Divine Comedy, etc. Um, it is in this room that the family circle draws together, most naturally, around the fireplace, whose fine Georgian mantle surmounts a stone lintel and jam, an old corner covered with its original decorated H hinges and molded glass holds decanters and toddy glasses belonging to Josiah, Isaac's grandson, as well as many pieces of Castleford and Delfware dating from the 18th century, so the, those would have belonged to the original uh, occupants. On the walls hang many family documents and three striking portraits. 
One is of Mrs. Nathan Eddy. That would be over here. Unfortunately, we can't see it. Um, on the west wall is a portrait of Heman Allen, nephew of Ethan and great-grandfather of the present owner, Mr. Lyles. Over the mantel is a portrait of Henry E. Lyles, his, James's father. Um, some poignant moments of family history as well as the American history are here revealed and recorded in documents, letters, diaries, and pictures. The very heartbeat of the Lawrence family can be heard here in the old tre house treasures them all. Um, it seems fitting to begin the characterization of the family with some excerpts from Lawrence, Isaac Lawrence's will, so meticulous in every detail that it testifies to the extraordinary thought and care he must have expended uh, to distribute his worldly goods. I, that will, by the way, is not available online. You can research it on uh, Ancestry.com. Um, they say in the, in the family genealogy that he um, freed all his slaves except one. I doubt that very much. I, in his will, in the will of Josiah, Will of Jonas, I found no reference at all to will, uh, to slaves being freed. And they have on the wall eight, an 1803 document freeing the last of the slaves. So I doubt that he freed them all in his will. I don't know how many he had at that point. Uh, at one point, he had 20 enslaved people working on his farms. And that puts him in the top 1% of slave owners in Connecticut at that time. Um, he, in his will, he, he did what was customary at that time. He distributed a, a share to his wife, his second wife, Amy, and, uh, and she got the north room of my dwelling house where I now live with a cellar under it with an iron trammel. Um, a shovel and tongs, two chests with drawers, one plane, also one third of my linen, pewter, glass, crockery, and earthenware, also one third of my chairs, except what shall be hereafter given, with one third part of my wooden utensils belonging to my house for family use, also one pair of flat irons, two candlesticks, and a candle snuffer one-third of my knives and forks, one small gilt trunk, one iron skillet, and three cider barrels to be hers and her, her heirs forever. It was pretty precise, but it did cut down on arguments. <laughs> because the other half of the house was going to be uh, lived in by Jonas, except problem number one, Jonas died the same year as his father. So that, that kind of destroyed the natural progression. And then Josiah, Jonas's son, took over. Um, the Adams, I suspect, may, may have been living in the Yellow House. And then later, they moved to the house that's immediately adjacent to the firehouse now. And that's where um, William, who was a great chronicler of things, eventually died. Um, the house went through many incarnations uh, for a while. William's son, Sarah, ran a boarding school there for young girls. Uh, she and Annette Dunning, a friend, had a boarding uh, school there. Um, later, Hiram Eddy lived in it. He had married into the family and was the pastor of the uh, Congregational Church for a number of years before moving to Winston, just about the time of the start of the Civil War. Hiram looms large in the history of this building, however, because um, his heirs went on to own it and to live in it. Uh, and many, many, many trunkloads of his sermons built, written in a huge looping hand that he probably could read easily in the pulpit are in trunks in the attic. This family has preserved its history, as has the Adam family. And they, um, they have a lot of documents that 
account for their, their time here. Um, Hiram was there in, in the 80s. Um, Sam Eddy, who was born down in New York City, used to come up for the summer and spend time up here. And uh, I have a charming, I have seen a charming little letter written by his sister who was there visiting her grandparents for the summer. And she, she says, uh, Sammy cut his feet yesterday. <laughs> Apparently he had been wading in the river and, and stepped on something sharp, but he had cut his feet. Um, so when you get closer to the 20th century, the family, as I said, is still grouped around this neighborhood. Allerton Eddy had returned to the area. Lawrence had returned to the area. Um, Allerton established the Canaan Water Company in the, um, right around the turn of the 20th century. So he actually uh, is responsible for much of Canaan having had clean water delivered from a, a actually a large frog pond, <laughs> if you want to know the truth, on the side of Canaan Mountain. That was recently, within decades, sold to the uh, Pfizer, which is mined back in there, and it, it no longer exists. But when my father was working for Allerton in the 50s, every Sunday we would have to hike the side of the mountain to go up and, and check, and make sure nothing awful had happened, like a dead, dead deer or something like that in the reservoir. And I would spend my time catching frogs while dead did what he needed to do. Um, Mr. Lyles, as I said, did a, in a marvelous, meticulous restoration of the property, removed many coats of paint, got rid of Victorian abominations, and then it has come down through his family since. It's currently owned by Chip Goodyear, and Chip has taken up the mantle and has put the house in good order for its third century. He's had a lot of very professional conservation done, and um, he had a, a much less grand but still very welcome open house when he finished his work, or at least a large part of it, in the, uh, right around the turn of the 2000s. And um, I was able to go in it then again, and love the place. And I noticed that he had, among other things, uh, taken the dress that was worn by Charlotte and William Adams' four-year-old daughter in a portrait that they have in the house, and he'd had it conserved and encased in a, a glass case and put right underneath the picture. So you've got um, the girl and her brother, Robert and Sarah, I think they are, uh, Robert's holding a, a blue book. I don't know what happened to the book. There's a little dog that's obviously long gone, but she's holding a doll. They still have the doll. And they have uh, the dress beautifully preserved. So that, uh, the picture was painted in 1832, so it's got some age on it. Upstairs in the ballroom, this house had a ballroom, and it was used for town meetings and for social gatherings. It's got a, a fiddler's gallery and uh, has been used on occasion, particularly at the 1951 um, open house. They had an 80-year-old fiddler up there at that time. Um, downstairs, we're going to circle back to the beginning here. Guess what's in the ballroom? <coughs> they still have the loom that he camped under the first night they came to Canaan. And it's still useful if, they, if it's set up and used. in the permanent seats that go around the walls of the, uh, of the room where dancers used to sit. Underneath them there are, are so many ledgers and documents and whatnot. I think it would take a century to process them all, but what history lies there? Um, I'm hoping that someday I'll be able to do what I'm doing with the Adams now and, and going through and scanning the documents and putting them into a digital format. 90% uh, of the Adams stuff has, has been uh, business papers and receipts, but they, they create a, uh, 
image of just a fabulously busy society that was growing like crazy with business enterprises that extended out to Pennsylvania, New York City, Upper New York State, Massachusetts. I mean, it was amazing where he was buying land and what they were doing. And this man was, was equally ambitious. So that is about what I know about the Lord's Tavern. Okay. Any questions? It, uh, I know, th does the granddaughter come up and stay in the summertime, Elizabeth Goodyear, does she come up and, and spend some of the time? That's, that's Chip's wife, so he is the grandson. Grandson, okay. Um, yeah, they, I, I don't, I don't know their schedule, but they, they do use the building, and their children, I know, come. Their children are getting quite grown, so the tenth generation is coming on. But he's he's done a wonderful job of, of maintaining the historic quality of the building. Most of the modern stuff is to the back and not intruding on the old section. Anyone else got a question about? The other side of the Blackberry River, uh, I mean, going south, so yeah. where it was Dr. Segalis' house. Right. And what, what, and then some modern cottage kind of houses, or I guess it's a, um, what would you call it, Cape Cod style, and then, then there's the gal's house, right. and then there's my house. Right. What, what was, used to be between, say, the gal's house and the river, or, or Dr. Segalis' house? Um, where the Gow's house was, that was a sash and blind shop. Yeah, and I kind of suspect, um, although I haven't traced that business back, I kind of suspect the Lawrence's may have been, because he set up a sawmill almost immediately. The, one of the first things you needed when you got into a new place was to set up a mill to process wood so that people could build. And while that, that would not have been his first site for it, because he put up a sawmill the first year he was there, in the first months, um, and he couldn't have put it exactly there because he needed the water. And they had to build a canal, and you can still see the remnants of the canal that comes around there, just a depression. So there was a sawmill there later, sash and blind shop. I think. Probably his was, you know, not very far from that, but on the actual river in the beginning. Anybody else got anything they'd like to know about this marvelous old place? Uh, just on a personal note, I remember going over to see Jim Miles um, when he had first retired. He was in the process of renovating the Lawrence Tavern, and he had just uncovered the fireplace in the store. Was a, he was so proud yep. of that home. Yep. And he, he just spent most of his retirement years uh, renovating it. And yep. he, um, he was just so proud of it. Canaan is very lucky to have such an emblematic building to uh, <laughs> to show its, its past and the tenor of the people that, um, that came here and the way that they worked, what enterprise they brought with them. Uh, Squire Forbes' house, <coughs> excuse me, is a, maybe a decade later than the, the tavern, and it, it's <laughs> classified as the second good house in Canaan. I don't know how the Douglas family would have felt about that because they had a pretty nice house down. Yeah, they did. And yeah. it's been it's been pretty well chewed up now, but it it also was a large a large farmhouse. So where was that? Um, it's down right across the drive from the it's the Hitchcock building right across the drive from the golf course. That was the Douglas homestead. And I'm sure there were others that were very nice. I was always devastated that they tore down the Yellow House. Oh, that was, yeah. Yeah, that, that's a, a huge cultural loss as far as I'm concerned. That was a beautiful home inside. Yeah. yeah. The, the, the huge fireplaces and yeah. the molding and 
it was just a delightful house to, yeah. to visit. Yeah, I, I vague, vaguely remember the inside, uh, just an impression of the antiquity of it. Yeah. <clears throat> we were uh, taken there for dinner one night when my father was working for Allerton, because they, they owned the house at that time. <coughs> and uh, being a good German papa, he had told me and my brothers and sister that we were to absolutely under no circumstances speak or say that we didn't like anything that we were given. She served up a tuna casserole with canned mushrooms in them, and I was, I was gagging. I didn't know what to do. I couldn't get those mushrooms down, and yet I didn't dare say a word. So I remember the the house well. She <laughs> knew how to stretch her food. <laughs> Yeah. What about the two white 19th century houses, the, the, I guess, where the Buckley boys live? You know, I guess that's what they call that. Uh, Up on Church Terrace? Yeah. yeah. At both, at the top of Church, there's yeah. one with, with the columns. I really don't. Cut, and I then don't, the one next to it. Which I don't know much about them at all. I mean, because they're, they're safe. They have the whole, so yeah, I have, a, I have an architectural survey of Canaan. Um, and those are, some of those houses are older up there, some are, are relatively modern, but um, they, uh, I, d I don't know much about them. You know what is an old building on that stretch going, <clears throat> going towards uh, your place actually? On the left there's a funny little stucco building that the walls are kind of scoogy on. Um, that was the original schoolhouse and it was down um, in the uh, St. Joseph's parking lot. And when they built the academy, built the academy, what year? In the, around 1850, I think. Somebody bought that. Nobody wasted anything. They bought it and brought it up there and used it as a residence. But the original part of that house is the oldest, is the old school for the center of Canaan. The and earliest schools were out in East Canaan. I don't know. No, I think this one was just a residence as long as I knew it. So. That was called the Yellow Dog. I never knew it, but it was, according to Albert Marshall, at the time he was a child, um, apartments upstairs, yeah. a funeral home on the ground floor, and a Chinese laundry in the basement. Yeah. That was very close. We called it the Haunted House. Did you? <laughs> it was falling down. Yeah, and then of course they had the gas station there. And, but Albert remembers lying <coughs> in the upstairs apartment and looking down towards the depot and seeing them unload the uh, circus animals and take them off to water them. And so he would have a front row seat and see the circus train unload in the night, which sounds kind of charming in its own way. One of the things I think it's interesting to note, and I'm going to close with this, um, we look at this little cluster of buildings, and they were built over the course of uh, 40 or 50 years, right across around the Lawrence Tavern. And they were a hub of business, and there were more, more shops that went down Lower Road that were associated with the Adam family um, and Fitch Ferris. So we tend to think of New England villages as being built around a green, and, and we have this kind of image of this wonderful pastoral setting with white buildings clustered <coughs> around and, and stores and whatnot. <clears throat> That's not the way colonial society was set up. Most, um, most businesses were conducted either out of homes or out of out of small buildings that were adjacent to the home, and they were scattered throughout the, the landscape. 
and the commons were not nice places. They were, they were very frequently devoid of vegetation because people put their animals out on them. So there was garbage dumped on them. There was animal manure. There were no trees. <clears throat> and it wasn't until the, the antiquarian movement, the colonial revival, um, that these things were spiffed up and made into what we now consider to be the green. As I understand it, the origin, origin of the green came from the earliest days of settlement in this country when the ships would come in and the, the landowners, the proprietors, would have land farther from the green, but they were required to have their houses around the green for mutual defense. And that's why we had greens, but their, their properties might have been long strips that went out, so they might have been farming at quite a distance from their actual home. <coughs> so Canaan, Canaan was broad, spread out. Most of the business, most of the development was out in East Canaan. And uh, then, it, as we've said before, when the train came, then we started to build up a nuclear village in 1841. Prior to that, there wasn't much here. When was Route 44 developed, as opposed to Lower Road, which I assume in early days was the main thoroughfare? Um, well, there was a lot of traffic on the Lower Road. Go back to where it was here. Was this out too soon? What was it? All right, Catherine, think. <laughs> Next time you can do Scotland 2017. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. What did I do with the Lawrence? Did anybody see the Lawrence file? Oh, it's over here. That's why. Okay, um, this, let me see, there's, there's the Lawrence property, and out here is a road. It may not be the exact path of 44 now, but this is the meeting house right here, which is the corner of Trescott Hill. So this is roughly 44 paralleling Lower Road. Now what's interesting here, is that right over in here somewhere, I can't quite read it, is a, a little building that's indicated and it's listed as being the Negro Meeting House, which I have never found any other reference to anywhere. The fact that we had a separate place of worship for the black families. I always thought they just sat in the gallery of the main meeting house. So the road system has changed a little bit, but it's, it's still, you can still see the basics of what we have today. This is uh, Route 7 South, roughly. This looks like it's probably the sand road going off this direction. We don't have Route 7 going up like that, though. It kind of goes off over here. And Fred Hall, eventually, it kind of went up to here. And Fred Hall showed me the building that it's now been reconstructed. That was the toll, toll building up in Sheffield. Where is it reconstructed, Kathy? As you're going up Old Route 7? Yeah. Um, I can't remember the name of the farm, but there used to be a big farm on the right. Mm -hmm. And then you go yeah. past that just yeah. a little bit, and there's a little shingle building. Mm -hmm. That was yeah. the toll house. Oh, okay. And the road came over from um, Ashwatog and that area and up from Honey Hill and they converged there. This is an interesting map. I wish it had more on it. He says it's the land around the farms and his farm, the Adam farm. But, and I was hoping it would have the original Forbes furnace on it, but I don't really see it. 
I was hoping it would illustrate that. This, this is the, uh, this here is the uh, Lawrence property, and I think this is Fitch Ferris's house here, if indeed that's what it is. But you see, there's nothing over in here. So, anything else I can help anyone with? Okay, we're going to uh, take a couple of months break here, um, back in September. And uh, anybody got any suggestion as to what they might like to talk about in September? Remember, you're helping me to write my book, so come up with it. <laughs> We've done, um, we've done the revolution, we've done Indians, we've done World War I, we've done World War II, we've done the Spanish influenza, we've done Native Americans, we've done, uh, schools. pardon me? We did schools, I think. We did schools. Um, did we do schools? Schools would be great for September. Yeah, I can't remember whether we did them or not, boy. Or something else then. You know, it's getting so it's all new. <laughs> Why don't we do schools in September? If I can't remember, probably you do. <laughs> I'll try to come up with something fresh. Anyone else have anything they'd like to learn? Uh, it's kind of a uh, program, but today is the vote on the town and town budget at 7.30 tonight. So. Show up and vote. Is there anything about the Italians? It's a, it's I'm sorry? Is there anything about the Italians? I have not done the Italians yet, and that's an area that I have been very interested in. Um, I know Julia Segala has researched that, and I'm supposed to go talk to her, so that that could be a one, good one. Why don't, we, why don't we bank that for October, and then we're, we're well into the season. Uh, Does that work for everyone? Yeah. Sure. Yes, sir. You know where the... Uh, State of Connecticut came in and uh, stole all our land over here to put in that road and then put in the new road yeah, yeah. Uh, against the old road. You know. Yeah, that was that was a tragedy and that was the end of that beautiful little yellow house. Yeah. They they tore that down for the road they never yeah. built. Yeah. Yeah. I had a little dealing with them and then they're gonna put me in jail. <laughs> back to, during the days, you know, and I, I said, how much would it cost us to get that back? And they mentioned some god-awful number, and I said, you know, you guys are a bunch of goddamn thieves. Yeah, you just took it. Yeah. And finally, I think they wound up doing this on it. I don't know. Yeah. Well, the, uh, the Lawrence Field, which uh, was appropriately named since it was Lawrence property, um, at the time that, that they came up with that benighted plan, it was such a, a wonderful gathering place for it. It still is. I mean, we, yeah. We've got it back to a large degree, but we had the community house, right. and that was a classic building um, and a, a very pleasant place for people to gather. Now it's the ambulance building. and. Uh, the pretty little yellow house is McDonald's. Yeah, yeah, yeah. What a tragedy. It was a trap, and because so many people lost their property, you know, just, you know, it's a terrible situation. I, <clears throat> I'd like to, uh, maybe, maybe I'll poke around and see if I can get information on that, because it did have a significant impact on Canaan, and um, it never happened. But I, my experience with trying to get information from the DOT is that they have nothing. They don't keep files going back that far. I tried to research a bridge down in uh, New Milford, and it was, what bridge? <laughs> All right.